from my earliest memory to my teenagehood, church life, uh, ministry, and Christianity, they've really been at the center of my life. Growing up, my parents had a deep connection to the church. They served faithfully uh, my entire life. They still are. And, you know, there were times when I kind of felt like a pastor's kid, even though I wasn't, because my parents uh, were just so heavily involved in the church. Um, my family was front and center uh, a lot in our church, and especially in such a small community, uh, maintaining that perfect Christian image. Uh, I think it was a pressure that I think we all felt a lot. Pairing this with my shyness, I think I struggled to really know God's calling uh, for my life for quite some time. And it was during my time at St. Thomas where I was involved in a local youth group uh, where God began to kind of reveal this to me. And it was through the act of worship where I felt God call me to full-time ministry. And, and admittedly, this was not a role that I ever saw myself being in. Uh, but God, He continued to just put full-time ministry in my heart. And well, here we are today. Having felt the strong call to ministry, I decided to enroll at Kingswood. Uh, and that's where I met my wife, Lindsay. And what was really one of the scariest things that I'd ever done, it turned out to really just be one of the biggest blessings in my life. At the time, Kingswood challenged me to grow in ways that I didn't really think was possible. Uh, I continued to grow my identity and, and my relationship with the Lord. I gained a deep appreciation and reverence for, for theology and, and ecclesiology and homiletics. And when I think back on this season, I, I'm just so grateful for the Lord's persistence. So here we are, um, I'm almost 30, uh, having family and, and this amazing church family as well. And I'm just incredibly, incredibly thankful. Um, you know, God continues to reveal his calling to me daily. Uh, he frequently challenges me in, in my role as a father uh, and as a husband and, and as a pastor. And his goodness is abundant uh, and his blessing I always jump back to my time at Kingswood for a lot of pivotal moments in my faith. I spent a year on campus, uh, and during that time, myself along with uh, probably three or four other students, we traveled to Moncton each weekend to, to help out with the youth ministry at Hillside Baptist. I received a lot of mentorship during this time from the youth pastor, Roger Reed, uh, and I learned, I learned so much from him, and, and I really carried a lot of that into ministry myself. One of the first conversations I had with Roger, it was over the phone, and, and Roger asked me if I liked coffee. And if you know me at all, you probably know what my answer to that question was. And it might seem like a very surface level question, but, but Roger showed me how much value there can be in, in just a simple cup of coffee. Well, every Friday, Roger would pick us up on, in his van on the Kingswood campus. Uh, and, and he opened up his home for, for the, the entire weekend uh, before driving us back on Sunday afternoon. His hospitality and his gener generosity were awesome, but really the best bonding and mentorship I think happened uh, in those cups of coffee. Conversations that, that could take place over an Americano at Starbucks or, or French press on Saturday mornings at Roger's kitchen table are, are really what I remember the most, and I try and carry that into the relationships that I build now. It's incredibly encouraging to be a part of a church family that's been so open and welcoming to me and my family. I'll be coming up on four years at OBC this summer and it's been just really awesome to see us grow as a church through that time, uh, to watch how we've pulled together as a family in the midst of a global pandemic, come on. Uh, navigating changes and, and restrictions and adaptations has been crazy. There's so much and, and so many to really be grateful for in this place. Uh, in these last three and a half years, they've been an adventure of growth and discovery, not only for me and my family, but for OBC as well. Uh, and it's such a blessing for us to be involved in a church who cares deeply and, and loves big. From barbecues at, at the house to our prayer warriors like Elaine uh, like Robinson, um, and to awesome conversations over cups of coffee with people like Mark Tully. Uh, OBC is made up of truly beautiful people. 
uh, who make an impact for the kingdom uh, in both their words and their actions. It's a great opportunity to be a part of this adventure with you all. dry in here today. We good, Stuart? I'm on? Yeah, I can hear me. Cool. Okay, now that I have the platform, uh, I can let you all know I'm aware about the length of my hair. <laughs> yes, it was an intentional choice. No, I'm not going through anything. My wife did point out I have a, a glimpse, a glimpse of a receding hairline. I've never grown it out this long in the past, so before it really starts to go, I just I want to see what it'll be like. So before we move on, do I have anyone in the room that is team long hair? They're all online, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for your support. <laughs> Good morning again. Um, can I get the, my slide deck up there, Stuart, as well? So, whoops, one slide, a little late. <laughs> okay, so where are my science fiction fans in the room? We got a few, cool. Any of you like really interested in like astrophysics or, or like interstellar phenomena like, like black holes or, or supernovae? I'll take that as a no. These sorts of things, they really fascinate me, okay? Even though I can't really wrap my head around them myself, uh, I'm not a physicist. I was never and will never be smart enough to be a physicist. But I do like science fiction, so let's try another question. Which is better, Star Wars or Star Trek? Who's for Star Wars? All right, who's for Star Trek? Some are undecided. It is a tough one, I understand. I'm a fan of both, definitely more into Star Wars. Uh, I just watched The Book of Boba Fett on, on Disney+. Plus. Uh, if, you, if you have Disney+, Plus, I do encourage you to go and check that one out. Anyway, I, I do like Star Trek as well. I didn't used to like it. I find the writing... I'll be careful what I say. <laughs> I find the writing can be a little cringe at times, but I really got into this new Star Trek series on the Space Channel. It's called Star Trek Discovery, uh, and it follows the adventures of Captain Michael Burnham and her crew aboard a, star a starship called Discovery. So it's in the middle of its fourth season right now, and the big threat that the Discovery is investigating this season is something that they call the DMA, or the Dark Matter Anomaly. And we don't know exactly where this anomaly came from, um, we don't know what it is yet, but we do know that it's an extremely powerful force that's able to wipe out entire planets just by simply moving through them. And Discovery's mission is to figure out just what and where this anomaly came from and how they can stop it before it annihilates the entire universe. Now, we here on Earth, we're not facing these kinds of threats in real life. Some really powerful forces do exist in the known universe. The sheer power of things like, like black holes or quasars or gamma ray bursts, uh, they absolutely boggle me. They, they astound me. They're some of the most powerful forces out there. Sometimes I'll get into this internet dive where I'm going in, I'm reading about these phenomena, and I'm, I'm reading along, and I'm just like, I'm getting a little nervous. And I'm typing things like, okay, how close are we to a black hole? Okay, they discovered a new one, pretty small, 1,500 light years away. Okay, I think I can live with that. Uh, but man, I am glad that our planet isn't anywhere near any of this stuff, because if we were, I don't think anything would be able to stop its power. So we've started a new series here at OBC called This Is Us. We're looking at the church as the people is you and me, and this morning we're going to jump into the book of Acts because what better place to go in the Bible than the book of Acts to learn about the church. We aren't going to be talking about science fiction this morning, but I do want to talk about this idea of unstoppable 
power. And it's not a physical power that comes from something like a supernova, but rather a spiritual power that comes from the Holy Spirit at work in us and at work in the church. So if you've read through the book of Acts, you might remember in chapter 1, uh, when the disciples, they're, they're watching Jesus ascend into heaven. They're, they're at a loss of what to do and how to do it as he's going up uh, to, to sit at the right hand of the Father. And, and then he, he leaves them to build his church. And, and it talks about how Jesus, he left his spirit to dwell within them. And so even in the midst of their worry, the church, it still grew because the power of the Holy Spirit working through them couldn't be stopped. And so I want to expand on this Holy Spirit power this morning. To do that, we're going to move into Acts chapter 5. We'll be jumping toward the end of the chapter. We're starting verse 22, and we're reading all, all the way through to the end, so right up to verse 42. So Acts 5, 22 through 42. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Would you pray with me this morning? God, thank you for being here in this place. We know you're here. We're expectant. We're looking forward to what you're going to do here this morning, Lord. Thank you for everyone who has come out. Thank you for those watching at home. We just pray, Lord, that you will enter in, that you will speak to all of us, that we will hear you, that we will be attentive, that we will be ready. Thank you for the church. Thank you for your son. 
for burgeoning that church forward, Lord. We're so grateful and blessed to be a part of your kingdom building here on earth as it is in heaven. We look forward to that. We look forward to you coming back, Lord. We look forward to being with you forever and ever. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your ultimate sacrifice in your son. As we move forward this morning, I just pray, Lord, that your word will be heard, that we will be focused, that you will be on our hearts and on our minds, that we will leave with something from you. We're believing in that, we're trusting in that, and we love you this morning, Lord, and we pray these things in your name, amen. So, in the previous chapter, if you've read chapter 4 of Acts, uh, much like Peter and John, in chapter 4, a few verses earlier, in chapter 5, we see the apostles, they're in Jerusalem, they're healing in Jesus' name, and again, like we see in chapter 4, after Peter and John heal a a man who had been lame since birth, uh, the Jewish authorities, they became angry in chapter 5 as well, that the apostles are, are healing in Jesus' name. They're, 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 they're angry that they're teaching in Jesus' name. They're angry that this is all happening. They had the apostles put in jail. So we don't know how many of the apostles were here for sure. Peter, definitely. John, probably. Likely at least some of the other apostles as well. So they were put in jail for teaching and healing in Jesus' name. Uh, but, but check this out. What happens in verse 19? This is just a couple of verses before a passage. So here it is. It says, But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And then right after in verse 21, At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. So here's what happened, right? The disciples, they're put in jail for talking about Jesus. An angel broke them out of jail, and instead of fleeing the scene, like most criminals probably would, they actually go back to the temple, and they just start teaching people about Jesus again. They just start all over again. Uh, and, And it's like... Okay, what? So I'm covering a series on Acts with our youth right now, and and last week we talked about boldness. So these guys, they're just as bold as they come, right? They go right back to the temple. They're teaching again. So then we come to our passage. So let's look at that again, okay? Beginning in verse 22. On arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. So just think about how hilarious this situation is for a second, right? The chief priests, they are on their way to judge these prisoners When they show up, the guards, they're standing there, carefully guarding these locked but empty prison cells. And they have no idea what's happened. The scriptures say that they were actually at a loss. They didn't know what to do. Then someone approaches them and says, hey, I see you're looking for those men that you threw in jail. They're actually back at the temple teaching again. See, the apostles had inexplicably escaped from a locked and guarded prison, and they were back at the temple teaching the ways of Jesus, because try as the Jewish authorities might, the power of the Holy Spirit couldn't be contained. And that's true for us today, too. So the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be contained. So I watch these top ten videos on YouTube on this channel. It's called Watch Mojo. Has anyone ever heard of this? Anyone watch top 10 videos themselves? Cool. All right. So I can get lost in these videos, okay? I get really into the ones that have anything to do with, like, anything, like, scary or or creepy, right? Anything about, like, horror movies or insects, strange events, paranormal stuff. 
like giant catastrophes. And one that I've been into recently, uh, natural disasters. And there was one that I watched a few weeks ago, and that was all about the top 10 volcanic eruptions in history. So again, I'm not a scientist. But from what I understand, a volcano erupts because the magma inside, it gets too thick. And so the gases, they aren't able to escape. And as a result, this giant pressure starts building. And as the magma rises closer to the surface of the volcano, uh, and, and as it approaches the surface, uh, the volcano will shoot out ash and, and debris, or the, the magma will spew out in eruptions of lava. So one of the volcanic eruptions on this top 10 list that I watched was the eruption of, uh, on the island of Krakatoa in August of 1883. Anyone heard of this? A few of you? Okay, so don't get me wrong. The devastation from, from the ash and debris, it was intense. Besides the extreme death toll, uh, the volcano, it, shot, it actually shot so much of its contents up into the atmosphere that for a long time, people all over the world we're experiencing a drop in the Earth's temperature, darkened skies, weird, oddly colored sunsets. But what astonished me most about the Krakatoa eruption, it wasn't the eruption itself, but rather the sound it made when it happened. It said that the sound of the eruption was heard over a twelfth of the Earth's surface. Potentially the loudest sound that the Earth has ever made. And in case you need some perspective, Krakatoa is located in Indonesia. And it was heard as a distant gunshot all the way in West Australia and the Indian Ocean. So that's like if we stomped our feet here at OBC right now, and, and it was so loud that people could hear us all the way in Europe. Like, this is loud. The sound of Krakatoa, it shattered the eardrums of sailors who were sailing 40 miles away. That's like from here to, to, to like Grand Bay, just outside of St. John. Like this was loud, seriously. And even after it had settled and quieted to a volume that couldn't be detected by human ears, those sound waves, they continued to ripple across the earth for days, riding it out. Apparently they circled the globe up to four times. So while the universe has some pretty mind-boggling phenomena here on earth, nature can unleash some pretty intense power of its own. But the thing about the Krakatoa eruption is once that sound cracked into the atmosphere, it spread. And it spread fast. And here's the thing about sound. You can't stop it from moving. It's an invisible force, like wind. The most you can do is try to block it out. But with powerhouse like Krakatoa, there wouldn't have been anything that could have even come close to muting it. The power of the Holy Spirit cannot be contained. You can't lock him up. You could try. Others can try. You could try to keep him in. You could try and block him out, but he'll escape. He'll get through because he can't be stopped and he cannot be contained. The Holy Spirit is a powerhouse. He's just that strong. The Jewish authorities tried to keep him at bay. They threatened the apostles not to speak in Jesus' name. They threw them in a prison cell to keep them quiet. They used every ounce of their power to keep the Holy Spirit from moving across the nations. But the thing about the Holy Spirit is you can't stop him from moving. He is too powerful, and he is at work. He was at work in the apostles. He is at work in his church. He is at work in you and me. And we, when you give your life to Jesus and you say, Spirit, use me, you better bet that he will. And there won't be anything that you or anyone else can do to stop him because the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be contained. So what happens next? Well, the apostles are brought before the Sanhedrin, so the Jewish council, who again, they warn them not to teach about Jesus, and because the Holy Spirit cannot be contained, the apostles respond saying, hey, we've got to obey God over human beings, no matter how much power those humans have. They even start to, to sort of preach here, right? Like, they're on trial for teaching people about Jesus, and their defense is to teach people about Jesus. 
So they say the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. God exalted him to his own right hand. We are witnesses of these things. And then we see the response from a Pharisee in this next collection of verses. His name is Gamaliel. uh, And he addresses the Sanhedrin beginning in verse 35. So here's what he says. He says, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Gamaliel makes an interesting point to the Sanhedrin in our passage. And the point is this, not only can the power of the Holy Spirit not be contained, but the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be matched power of the Holy Spirit cannot be matched. Now I'm sure if I asked the room, who is the best guitarist in the world? We get a few different answers. We might hear names like Jimmy Page or Eddie Van Halen, maybe Jimi Hendrix, Prince, Eric Clapton, but you know whose name I'm not going to hear? Mine. Mine. I'm not going to hear my own. Unless I am the only person that you've ever heard guitar, play guitar before, there should not be one person who would list me among those other names. Unless you're trying to make me feel really good, but trust me, I know it's insincere. I know how good I am at guitar, and I know that a lot of people uh, who are nowhere near as good as those other musicians, and they're still way better than I am. See, those guitarists who are known internationally for their talent, they are so beyond my level that I could barely even consider myself someone who plays guitar in comparison. They are just that good at what they do. Or in some of these instances, they're, they're just that good at what they did. Their abilities cannot be matched, at least for not, not for, for little Pastor Devin at Oromocto Baptist. And you know what someone would say to me if I tried to play like Van Halen's eruption right now, if they're being entirely honest, they'd say, what are you doing? That's not even close to the way it should sound. Stop trying to be Van Halen. He's too good. You can't do it. His talent can't be matched, at least not by me. I mean, at 28, with a one-year-old, I don't think I have enough time, (laughs) nearly enough time to get that good. So Gamaliel is a well-respected Pharisee Upon further investigation, we see in in Acts chapter 22 that that Paul had actually trained beneath him before he had given his life to Christ. So so Gamaliel, he's a wise guy. The Jewish authorities, they tend to listen to him, and he draws uh, draws reference first to Theodos. uh, we, We don't know too much about Theodos. All we know is that he likely had claimed to be some Messiah. He had a very small following, and he ended up being killed, and his followers, they basically just died off. and and nothing came of it. And next, Gamaliel mentions Judas the Galilean, who had led a revolt against Rome during the census, and basically the same thing happened. He was killed, followers dispersed, and that was that. Meanwhile, however, Jesus had been killed, and it seemed a different trend was occurring. Instead of his following simply scattering and fading away, the church actually seemed to be growing. This was an interesting development, one that Gamaliel took notice of. And so he advises the Sanhedrin, look, there's something different about these men. They're not backing down. This following is still growing. And I think it would be in your best interest to just let things run its course. And he says, just like these other guys, Theodos and Judas, if there's nothing legitimate about what the apostles are saying, 
they will get what's coming to them. But listen, if they are moving in God's power, I'll tell you right now that I do not want to be the one opposing it. We can't fight God. We'll lose. How many of you know that if you try and fight God, you'll lose? I'm not trying to undermine the strength of any of you, but I can say with some air of confidence that you wouldn't win that fight. Moses and Abraham, basically the only guys we see fight God and win. Moses and Abraham, okay? God's right-hand man during the Exodus and the father of his chosen nation. These are the only guys that fight God and win. And even they weren't so much fights as it kind of were like bargaining, right? God, remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Don't destroy the Israelites because they turn to false idols. God, if you can find just 10 righteous people in Sodom, tell me you won't destroy it. And God, listen, but again, not really fights, right? It's bargaining. But remember Jonah? Remember Saul before he became Paul? When you try to oppose God, he will win. And why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be matched. Gamaliel knew this. He wasn't even on the side of the apostles, and he knew this. He was smart enough to know, I don't want to mess with God. I don't want to get involved in that fight. He knew that any attempt at doing so would be completely useless. And I just love... Gamaliel's wisdom in this passage, this this Pharisee, this self-proclaimed enemy of the church, he sees these Jesus-following prisoners, and, and, and he looks to his own counsel, and he says, look, just let them go. If they're wrong, they're wrong. Nothing will come of what they're doing here. But if there's even an ounce of a possibility that they're right, if there's a slight chance that they're right and we're wrong, Do you really want to go up against the power of God? Do you really want to fight that fight? It's not often that we can glean a lesson on the Holy Spirit from the Pharisees. Usually when we stand up here and speak about them, it's about how Jesus is kind of talking them into corners, calling them out for hypocrisy. But then here in Acts 5, we see Gamaliel teaching the Sanhedrin, teaching us, that the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be matched. He cannot be matched, not by anything. Guess what? That's really good news for us. Do you know that? I know you do. The power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in you, the power that you have access to, cannot be matched by anything that might try and oppose it. This power is so strong that not even death stood a chance, okay? Think about that. You have power at work inside of you that even death can't conquer. It tried. It tried. It put Jesus on a cross. It wrapped him up in a tomb. It thought that it had won, but the power of the Holy Spirit was stronger. The power of the Holy Spirit could not be matched, so Jesus didn't stay in that tomb. Three days passed, and boom, he was gone. The tomb was empty. Death lost. God won. And he keeps on winning every single day that one of his people move in Holy Spirit power because that kind of power cannot be matched. That kind of power is relentless. So the power of the Holy Spirit cannot be contained. It cannot be matched. And it is relentless. Gamaliel's speech persuaded the Sanhedrin. That's in verse 40. And in the same verse, the apostles are flogged and set free. In verses 41 and 42, say the the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name day after day in the temple courts. And from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. I got to tell you, these last few weeks winter has taken its toll on me. I don't know about any of you. For a while there, it felt like I would finally finish the shoveling. Uh, I'd shovel the deck and the front step. I'd finish the snow blowing. And then the next day, we get buried with another 20 to 30 centimeters. Anyone else here felt that way? Yeah, it was awful. This is not the type of maintenance that I meant to sign up for when my wife and I bought a house. 
And, and then our snowblower would actually stop working a couple weeks ago. It would turn on. I could shift the gear, uh, but, but then it just wouldn't move. And so we had to get that fixed because, of course, later that week, the forecast was calling for yet another big storm. And then it turned out a lot of other stuff was wrong with the snowblower because the previous owner, uh, she, she didn't really have it maintained that well. And, and so $300 later, I'm out there snowblowing again. And, and look, I don't mind the snowblowing so much when I don't have to pay hundreds of dollars to have it repaired, but we have a, a pretty good sized deck and that, of course, needs to be shoveled. And I go out thinking, you know, this won't be that bad. But when there's like two or three feet of snow out there on your deck, you know, once you're about a quarter or a third of the way through, it is always that bad, right? <laughs> always is. Every time I'm tired, I'm sore, I'm out there taking off my jacket and my hat and my, my gloves, and it's like minus 15 out. But I'm just so hot, and, and don't get me started on the lovely collection of, of packed up snow and ice that the snow plow leaves behind at the end of the driveway. But I push through because it needs to be done. But man, in those last few weeks, uh, it, was, it was like my body just didn't have a chance to recuperate uh, from the work before we get hit with another storm. And I can tell you right now, my strength is nowhere near relentless. No one's is. And not just our physical strength, but our emotional strength, our mental strength, our spiritual strength, left to fend for ourselves, they will all deplete. They'll grow weary, will require rest. Human, human strength has a ceiling. The limit is different for everyone, but everyone has a limit. The power of the Holy Spirit does not have a limit. It is relentless. It has to be. There's no way the apostles could have con continued what they were doing if the power of the Holy Spirit is not relentless. Look at that. They had them flogged and threatened them not to speak in Jesus' name. Just in the previous chapter, Peter and John, they, they, they'd, they'd already been in prison once. They suffer more beatings, more imprisonments, more opposition, more persecution. And what do they do? They rejoiced because they had been counted worthy for suffering disgrace for the name. And they kept on teaching. You don't do that if you are operating under the limitations of your own strength. And you, unless you get some adrenaline rush from pain, when you put your hand on the hot stove, you pull it away. You don't go back for more. And I'm not saying that you need to get out there and take a beating for Jesus. But I am saying that there's a reason we're able to take on persecution and scrutiny as Jesus followers and continue to speak boldly about who he is and what he's done. And I'm telling you right now, it's not by our own strength. It is only through the relentless power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. That's it. That is the only way. It's the only way. Holy Spirit power can heal the sick. Holy Spirit power can cast out depression. Holy Spirit power can save broken marriages. Holy Spirit power can kill addiction. Holy Spirit power can raise the dead. Holy Spirit power can invigorate us to keep on going. And it keeps on going and going and going because it's relentless. It's a powerhouse on the move, with no signs of slowing down. It's unstoppable. You can't lock up the Holy Spirit. You can't hold him down. He's uncontainable. He's unmatched. He's relentless. That's the power that's at work inside of us in this church body, the church universal. I think sometimes we can forget that. Not intentionally, but we can lose sight of the reality of just how powerful the Holy Spirit is, and that we are given access to that power through Jesus' sacrifice for his church. And the apostles didn't forget. They just kept on going, moving in that Holy Spirit power, changing hearts and lives in the face of opposition. That's the church's legacy. It's one of which we are a part. So are you pressing into that? Are you ready to move in Holy Spirit power? Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, thank you for your spirit at work in us. Thank you for your spirit at work in this church. 
We're just so grateful that we get to be a part of this mission, that we get to be a part of your kingdom. We just, we just ask that you would enter in and that you would move through us in whatever way you need to, Lord. I pray that we will be open to that, that we will be ready to give up ourselves, make an offering of ourselves for you and your kingdom work. We're believing in you this morning, Lord. We leave this place in Holy Spirit power that is uncontainable, Holy Spirit power that is unmatched, Holy Spirit power that is relentless. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Pray these things in your name. Amen.